Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on transpiration and translocation. Now, before you watch this, make sure you're confident on the material on animal, plant, and bacterial cells, photosynthesis, and diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. I've got videos on all of those things earlier in this playlist. Now, in this video, we are going to start off by looking at root hair cells and xylem cells. This will then enable us to uh, explore transpiration and then translocation. Um, then finally, we'll explore the different factors that affect the rate of transpiration and end by looking at how we can investigate that uh, practically. Let's start by looking at root hair cells and xylem cells. Now, root hair cells, first of all, if you look very closely at the root of a plant, you'll see it is covered in these very, very fine hairs. Now, each one of those hairs is an individual root hair cell. Um, so the surface of the root is covered in these root hair cells. Now their job is to absorb water and minerals from the soil for the plant then to use as it needs. In terms of enabling them to do that, they have several adaptations. The first important adaptation is they have a large surface area. So this is why the, the root has this hair that sticks out. That long hair gives it a really big surface area which really increases the rate that they can absorb the water and the minerals. The second thing is they contain lots of mitochondria. Now, why is that? Well, let's have a look at the mineral ions, these pink ones. The concentration of mineral ions in the soil is much lower than the concentration of mineral ions in the root hair cell itself. And so therefore, in order to get those mineral ions into the root hair cell, we need to use active transport because that's required to move substances up a concentration gradient and therefore in order to power that active transport we need lots of mitochondria to provide the energy for it. Now our next kind of cell is called a xylem cell. Now these xylem cells they're found in the stems and trunks of plants. Now they're they are kind of tube-like cells for carrying water and minerals up the plant. So if we put it together you know the root hair cells absorb the water and minerals and then the xylem cells carry them up the plant. Now in terms of adaptations they've got a few. Firstly they are dead and they are hollow and the point of that is just giving them more volume to be able to carry water because that's their only job is to carry the water and the minerals. The second thing is that the cell walls between them break down to form a continuous tube so you can see these gaps in between each of the uh, xylem cells that's just to form a continuous channel so that the water and the mineral ions freely. And the last thing they've got is they are, the cells are reinforced with these tough bands of lignin. So you see these kind of circular bands around them there. That is lignin, which is there to help the xylem cells withstand the high water pressure of all of that water inside the plant. Transpiration. So transpiration is the movement of water and dissolved mineral ions um, from a plant's roots up its stem and to its leaves where it evaporates out into the air. Notice I've bolded up here. This is to reinforce the point that tr uh, transpiration is a one-way movement from the roots up towards the rest of the plant. Now, in terms of the process, um, how this actually happens, the first step is we have water entering the plant's roots via their root hair cells by osmosis for the most part. There's also some diffusion happening as well. Um, so some of the water just diffuses along the plant cell walls without actually going into the individual cells. So the next step we have is capillary action, where the water starts to move up the plant, right? Now, so the water travels up the plant through those hollow tubes called xylem that we met on the previous slide. And it does this by something called capillary action. Now, capillary action is something you might not be familiar with. Um, but I imagine most of you at some point have put a straw into a drink and noticed that the level of the drink inside the straw is normally just a little bit higher than the level of the uh, drink outside the straw. That's an example of capillary action. So capillary action is the way that water will naturally travel a short way up a tube. Now, the thinner that tube gets, the further the water travels up. So you can see here in this thin tube, the water has traveled a lot further up it than in the thicker tube. And so xylem tubes are very, very thin indeed. And so that means water will travel a long way up them. And that's how the water gets from the roots up to the rest of the plant. 
Um, and lastly then, the water evaporates out of the plant through the leaves stomata, um, which then enables more water and minerals to enter the roots. So the evaporation stage is really important because it creates the space for more water to enter at the bottom. And then that creates this kind of continuous flow of water coming in at the bottom of the plant and evaporating out of the top of the plant, drawing more water and more minerals up with it as it evaporates. Next we have translocation. So translocation is the movement of sucrose or sugar solution around a plant. It's not just up this time, it's actually in both directions, up and down, which we can summarize as around. Now, this takes place, uh, it starts at the leaves and it goes from the leaves to the rest of the plant through a new type of vessel called a phloem vessel. Now, this is both up and down the plant. The fancy word we use for that is bidirectional, so which, which means two directions, both up and down. Let's have a look at that phloem tissue then. So phloem tissue is tissue whose job is to transport sucrose solution. And remember, sucrose is just sugar. It's the chemical name for sugar. Okay, and the kind of kind of sugar you might put on your cornflakes uh, for breakfast. Now, phloem tissue is made of two kinds of cells. We've got sieve cells and companion cells. So let's look at these sieve cells first. So their job, they are tube-like cells for transporting the sucrose solution. And in terms of adaptations, um, if we if we look at the um, if we look at the um, sieve cells here, you can see they've got these hot these plates that sit between each of the sieve cells. They are called sieve plates, and they've got lots of holes in them that lets the sucrose solution travel easily from one sieve cell to the next. The other kind of cell we've got is the companion cell. Now that is these cells here that sit next to the sieve cells. Um, and their job is to pump sucrose solution into the phloem cells by active transport. Because the concentration of sucrose in the sieve cells is very high, we need to use active transport to get the sucrose in there because with just diffusion, the sucrose would actually leave the sieve cells. And that's not really what we want. We want the, you know as much sucrose in them as possible so it can get to the rest of the plant. So then, in terms of adaptations, in order to power that active transport, you'll see that the companion cells have got lots and lots of mitochondria to provide the energy for the active transport. So let's then quickly uh, pause and compare transpiration and translocation. This is a really common kind of six mark question that you often see on this stuff. Um, what's the difference between the two? Because they're very easily confused. So transpiration then. In terms of what is transported, transpiration transports water and mineral ions, whereas translocation transports sucrose solution. In terms of which direction is the, uh, is the material transported, transpiration is one direction only. It's from the roots up to the leaves, never from the leaves back down to the roots. Whereas with translocation, it is bidirectional. That means from the leaves to the rest of the plant, both up and down it, just to wherever it is needed. And lastly, which vessels are used? Um, so transpiration uses xylem vessels and translocation uses phloem vessels. Let's consider some of the factors affecting the rate of transpiration. So the first one is temperature. Now, the rate of transpiration increases at higher temperatures. Why is that? It's simply because at increased temperatures, we increase the rate of evaporation. And therefore, if more water is evaporating out of the leaves, the overall rate of transpiration will increase. The next factor to consider is air movement. Now, this one's a bit more difficult to explain. Um, but the key thing here is that the rate of transpiration increases with higher air speed. Now, why must that be? Well, let's consider that as the water evaporates from the leaf, the concentration of water molecules in the air increases. We can see that here, right? We can see these water molecules building up in the air as they evaporate out of the leaf. Now, if the air was completely still, we'd get quite a high concentration of water molecules um, building up around that leaf. And that lowers the concentration gradient between the leaf and the air, and that would slow down the rate of transpiration. 
or, or the rate of evaporation and therefore the rate of transpiration. However, when we've got air movement, what happens is as those air molecules are evaporated out of the leaf, they get blown away. And what that does is that means that we maintain a steep concentration gradient where there is a lot of water in the leaf and a very low concentration of water outside the leaf. And that means we keep a high rate of evaporation and therefore a high rate of transpiration. The last factor to consider is light intensity. Now again, light intensity increases the rate of transpiration. Why is that? It's because um, brighter light causes the stomata to open wider, allowing water to evaporate more quickly. So if we look at the light one here, the stomata, remember those holes on the bottom of the leaf, the stomata is opened wide because the guard cells have caused it to open wide, and that allows much more water to evaporate out compared to when we're in the dark and the stomata is closed now and so therefore very little or no water can evaporate. So now let's look at how we can investigate transpiration and we'll do this using a piece of apparatus called a photometer which looks like this. Now there are a few key things on the photometer. First of all we have a, a, you know, a branch or a, a stem from our plant that's been sealed into it and notice that the stem of the plant there is sticking into the water. We also have this capillary tube, this very, very thin um, glass tube. And in that thin glass tube, we introduce an air bubble. And we, uh, with, when we're investigating transpiration, we're going to monitor the movement of that air bubble and measure it using the scale here. So before we look at the detail of the method, remind ourselves that as water evaporates from the leaves and evaporates out by transpiration, more water will go into the stem from the reservoir here. What that will do is that will draw the air bubble along. So that air bubble is going to start moving towards the left. So this allow allows us to measure the rate of transpiration because what we can do is we can divide the distance the bubble moves by the time it takes it to move, and that can then give us a measure of actually how fast transpiration is taking place. So for example, you know, if we had, if we measured that the air bubble moved 21 millimeters uh, in a seven minute time period, then the rate of transpiration in this case would just be, we divide the distance, which was 21, by the time it took, which was seven minutes, and that would give us a rate of three millimeters per minute. Now, the, the units will vary depending on exactly how they've been taken, but that's a very simple way that you can actually measure the rate of transpiration. And so if you were to plan an investigation into transpiration, you can systematically investigate transpiration by varying the temperature or the light intensity or the airspeed and measuring the distance the bubble moves in a certain time and then doing this kind of calculation with it. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.